Well, good evening, everybody, or good morning, or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Uh, I am Samuel Maskett. Uh, I practice in Los Angeles. I'm a clinical professor uh, at the UCLA Stein Institute, and I work in the private practice at Advanced Vision Care, uh, also in Los Angeles. Uh, some of you may know of me, uh, others may not. I am a past president of the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery, and I've also been on the Board of Trustees of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, um, I'm the consultation section editor for the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. Um, it's evening here in the United States in the West Coast, so I'm going to speak to you this evening about malposition and malfunction in IOLs and how we manage them. Uh, I note that some of you uh, have a sentence and questions ahead of time, and I've looked those over, and the great majority of those will be answered during the presentation. Uh, you'll also have the opportunity to ask questions later on. I do have a lot of material to share with you, so uh, we'll try and, and move directly. Um, I do have some disclosures uh, with respect to relationship uh, with the manufacturing uh, sector, although I don't think any of these are particularly significant in this evening's presentation. And we're going to start off with a question. So the chief cause for early malpositioned IOL is pilot error, pseudofoliation syndrome, small pupil, glaucoma, and all of the above. So the chief cause for early postoperative malposition IOL, pilot error, pseudoexfoliation syndrome, small pupil, glaucoma, or all of the above. So let's take a look at what I consider the answer to be. Um, I notice that we have a 50-50 split between pseudoexfoliation and pilot error. Actually, pseudoexfoliation syndrome um, is a part of a condition of, or a combination of agents uh, or conditions uh, with progressive zonulopathy, uh, as we'll see when we consider late malposition IOL. But pilot error early after surgery uh, is the chief cause. Iatrogenic causes consist typically of uh, capsule rupture, um, missing the capsule bag with one or both of the haptics, damaging the zonul or damaging the IOL. Uh, endogenous zonulitis or previous trauma are secondary causes, but pilot error tends to be the first cause. Let's take a look at late malposition though. So the chief cause for late malposition IOL is glaucoma, pilot error, progressive zonulopathy, high myopia, or high hyperopia. So again, chief cause for late malposition would be glaucoma, pilot error, progressive zonulopathy, high myopia, or high hyperopia. And let's see, you suggested the majority of you that progressive zonulopathy would be, in fact, the cause. And uh, I do tend to agree with you. Um, and when we consider those uh, conditions that lead to progressive zonulopathy, uh, they include pseudoexfoliation syndrome. For some reason, we can't move the slide forward. Here we go. So late is mostly due to fibrometaplasia of the anterior subcapsular lens epithelial cells. As you can see here, there's fibrous tissue surrounding this malpositioned lens. And here's the submarine ring of the patient with pseudoexfoliation. And that fibrometaplasia tends to cause or fibrosis leads to phimosis. And we think that leads to zonulitis. And the most common conditions are pseudoexfoliation, uveitis, trauma, uh, retinopathy of prematurity, retinitis pigmentosa, 
And what's becoming a much more frequent observation is post vitrectomy eyes. We're not sure whether it's lysis of the zonules uh, at the time of vitrectomy or what all of those conditions tend to have in common is a chronic breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier. Take a look here at the importance of uh, LEC fibrometaplasia. The slide on the left here shows a patient with a lot of fibrosis of the capsule that has already been subjected to laser relaxing incisions. And we can see the single piece of acrylic haptic is distorted. And we compare that to the eye on the right, and we can see the capsule is barely, barely visible. These are two eyes of the same patient who had a chronic intermittent uveitis or pars planitis. And the slide on the right, no cleaning of the LECs were done at the time of cataract surgery, whereas here on the slide, example on the right, um, extensive cleaning of the LECs was carried out at surgery. And while this eye is about uh, three years post-operative, this is about a year post-operative, but you'll note a marked difference in the fibrometaplastic change of the LECs because they're essentially gone. And we hope, we think that this might be a factor in preventing late malposition. So here I'm using a shepherd wrench curette once the uh, nucleus and cortical material have been removed from the capsule bag, and I'm cleaning vigorously the undersurface, undersurface of the anterior capsule to the remove the anterior subcapsule LECs. And we can do this um, where we can see the capsule. You can't do this at the equator um, because those cells have tight junctions uh, to the lens capsule bag. And once the lens is in place and removed the OVD, we can note uh, how just remarkably clean that capsule appears. I do this in all my surgeries, although some people reserve it for those patients who are at risk due to exfoliation or what have you. Now, this device is referred to as a Singer Suite. Uh, for those of you who play golf, kind of looks a little bit like a seven iron. But uh, today I actually use this to a series of side port incisions instead of the shepherd wrench curette. So management strategy, uh, we've talked a little bit about cause. Uh, we have to take an individualized approach to all the eyes we face. We want to work under the least amount of light possible so we don't induce photos maculopathy. Microsurgical instruments are helpful. And the skills that we're going to need to have in our bag, so to speak, are the ability to reopen the capsule bag, to stabilize and capture the IOL, uh, either through pars plana, anteriorly. Um, we're going to also need to have the skills for vitrectomy, whether they're done via anteriorly or pars plana approach, removing lenses, cutting them, folding them, and then fixating IOLs either to the capsule bag or to the sclera are also important tools in our bag of tricks. In our office, we have a kind of a treatment algorithm for malposition IOLs. If it's a single piece of acrylic and it's in the sulcus that we know is a no-no. Uh, we always must remove a single piece of acrylic from the sulcus. Those patients are what we call a time bomb uh, with a fuse of variable length. And uh, they will cause an UG syndrome, uveitis, glaucoma, hyphema, because of the thick um, haptic, uh, which also tend to have an abrasive or sticky quality to them. Single piece of acrylic in the bag, we can lasso those to the eye wall. If it's a three-piece lens and it's in the sulcus, we have adequate capsule support, uh, then I think we prefer to fixate those to the iris or iris suture fixation. Without capsule support, the lens may have a tendency for late malposition, even suture to the iris, and then we will either fixate it to the sclera, uh, either in what's called the glued technique or now the Yamani flange technique. If it's in the bag, then we can um, lasso it through the bag with scleral suture fixation. Um, so let's talk a little bit about suturing. Here's your next question. Which suture material is most likely to deteriorate over time? Ado Gore-Tex, Henopolyester, Henoproline, Ninoproline, or perhaps all of the above. So once again, which suture material is most likely to deteriorate over time? Gore-Tex, Ado, 
polyester 10 proline 10 proline 9 or all of them. And let's see how you respond. Um, we have some mixed responses here. Um, actually, Gore-Tex suture is non-absorbable and actually becomes incorporated uh, in body tissue. Uh, we like it a lot. It's used in, in cardiovascular surgery. Um, and uh, while the package itself says not for use in the eye, um, we found that it's probably the best material or among the better materials. I also like Tenno polyester. It's a little more difficult to work with. Uh, it's also non-biodegradable, but currently off the market. Tenno polypropylene is the most likely to deteriorate, either through hydrolysis or friction. And so we no longer recommend the use of tenoproline for fixating IOL. Ninoproline can be used, but tenoproline we advise against. And here you can see some examples, the Gore-Tex on your left, um, the CV-8 with the TTC-9 needle is our current agent of choice. Um, tenoproline, we reserve for iris suturing, not suturing for the sclera. Um, there's also ninoproline, a few different manufacturers. And this is the Alcon polypropylene, which is presently not available. Now, the Hoffman pocket is a method that was devised for suturing IOLs to the eye wall that would uh, enable you to do this without dissecting conjunctiva, most typically valuable for patients who have had prior glaucoma surgery or retinal surgery with a lot of uh, conjunctival scarring, or we want to make sure we avoid conjunctival surgery if they would need to have future glaucoma filtering surgery. So here we put a marking device on the cornea and we're gonna mark exactly 180 degrees apart and the same axis as the loops of this three piece lens. A peripheral groove 300 microns deep is made in the cornea, clear cornea specifically. And then a crescent blade is used to dissect toward the equator of the eye or posteriorly. One wants to make sure they can see the blade through the tissue uh, so that we're not too deep, but also we don't want to be too superficial. Kind of a procedure feel. Now here, a 27 gauge needle is passed across the Hoffman pocket. And from an opposing paracentesis, the um, needle of the Gore-Tex suture is docked into the 27 gauge needle. Uh, now that same needle is passed through the Hoffman pocket, this time anterior to the capsule bag and loop complex. And the double arm sutures then pass through that same paracentesis, docked into the 27 gauge needle, and then brought out of the eye, creating a lasso or a loop of suture material through the bag around the loop of the lens. And when you pull on that, you see the lens move. Once both sides have been sutured, we then reach into the pocket and bring out the free end of the Gore-Tex suture. And we tend to then make a uh, lip knot and, and we don't tension it fully until we do the same thing on the other side and then progressively tension the knot until we have good centration of the lens. And then we finish our three one and one knot and once the knots are completely tied, um, they're cut and allowed to attract into the Hoffman pocket. And so we have precluded the need for conjunctival dissection. And we have a nice stable and centered lens. And it's a little bit different approach. Um, many of us have abandoned the Hoffman pocket um, because it's a little bit difficult to titrate the tension on the loops and hence the centration. This is a patient. Um, with retinitis pigmentosa, one of the conditions that we know is responsible for late decentration lens. We can see some fibrotic change in the anterior capsule. And we see this loop goes over here, but notice that the infrotemporal loop has been kind of doubled back on itself because of the fibrosis in the bag. Now, to remove this lens would require a big incision because it's made 
of a 7 uh, of PMMA, I'm sorry, 7 millimeter PMMA. So here I'm using another marking device so we can be exactly 180 degrees apart. And I'm going three millimeters posterior to the limbus and making a mark. And then passing again the same Gore-Tex suture um, through the Hoffman pocket, underneath the loop of the lens through the capsule bag, and docking it into a 27 gauge needle. I straighten out the Gore-Tex needle so they're not too curved and there's less of a tendency to strike the endothelium. And then a millimeter and a half anterior to that, I go through with a 27 gauge needle, this is full thickness sclera, after taking down the conjunctiva, we then turn the suture around and we have a loop now of suture material that goes around the loop of the lens through the bag. And as we pull it, we notice that that lens moves. If the lens doesn't move, when you cinch up on the suture, it means either both passages of the suture are in front of or both behind the lens and that's not going to get the job done. So you must have a loop around the loop. One pass goes underneath, one pass superficial to the loop. We pull it up and we watch the lens move and we know what the lens moves. Good, then we know. Now I'm going to do a slip knot, a one, one and one slip knot. And again, we're going to tension this. Now we can be a little bit more exacting with our tension than in the Hoffman pocket, but notice I did dissect the conjunctiva. Now, once I have completed the knots, um, it is very important to bury the suture ends into the scleral tissue or the exposed knots will eventually erode risk factor for endophthalmitis. And I'm using fiber adhesive to close the conjunctiva, although it could be sued uh, a sutured rather, or co-apted um, with pottery. Um, and you can okay. use the headphones if you have available there. Okay, so now I have another question for you. And uh, am I uh, more audible at this level? Uh, you yes, Dr. yes, Dr. Master. Good. So let's take a look at risk factors for late zonulitis. Suter exfoliation. Retinitis pigmentosa, retinopathy of prematurity, post-vitrectomy, or all of the above. So what risk factors are there for late zonulitis? Pseudoexfoliation, retinitis pigmentosa, retinopathy of prematurity, post-vitrectomy, or all of the above. Okay. So... Uh, again, divide a half and half between pseudoexfoliation and all of the above. Um, as I showed in a slide earlier, uh, pseudoexfoliation is the most common cause for late zonulitis, but every one of these conditions will definitely induce late zonulitis and are responsible for late malposition of the IOL. But pseudoexfoliation is the most common, but all of them are responsible for progressive fibrosis, phimosis, and zonulitis. And again, that's one of the reasons we like to clean the LECs as extensively as we can. Now, I mentioned post vitrectomy, and we're not really certain why the post vitrectomy eye is more likely to have progressive zonulopathy, but we know that we see this. And so uh, the question is why? Is it due to the vitreoretinal surgeon uh, lysing the posterior zonular fibers, or is it due to um, some change uh, perhaps in the blood aqueous um, barrier? Uh, we're really not sure, but all those conditions, uveitis, pseudoexfoliation, post vitrectomy, uh, ROP, and RT all tend to have chronic breakdown of the blood aqueous barrier. So, in an eye that is post vitrectomy, one of the concerns about a loose IOL is that when the zonular fibers let go, that lens falls very quickly. And an anterior segment surgeon is going to be very, very hard pressed to prevent that. So, I developed a method of making a little basket or safety net underneath the intraocular lens before you try to manipulate it. 
So I noticed that there's some questions. Let me see what your questions are. And can we use Gore-Tex suture and Hoffman pocket safely in children? And my answer to that question is absolutely yes. One of the problems that we run into, however, I'll answer it live here. One of the problems uh, that, that we run into is that some institutions do not allow us to use Gore-Tex suture because it is printed on the package, not for use in the eye. And this is the same question. So. But yes, I do use it in children. I think it is the best material to use in children because um, if, so long as you bury the knot, you have lifelong safety with it. Um, so what do we do? I'm back to the post vitrectomy eye where there's no buoyancy underneath the lens to keep it from falling rapidly should the remainder of the zonular fibers go while you're trying to manipulate the lens and control its position. So I developed um, a basket safety suture. Let's take a look at this. Let's freeze this for a moment. So we have here a one-eyed patient who lost the other eye following retinal detachment. What we notice here is that there's extensive conjunctival scarring. He's had a prior scleral buckle and vitrectomy. He's got 360 degrees of conjunctival scarring. So we might want to think about using the Hoffman pocket here to fixate the lens. But we'll also note that this lens is markedly subluxated uh, with very, very few zonular fibers. So anything we attempt to do might cause those few fibers to, to lice and the lens fall then into the posterior segment, making this a much more complex surgery. So what, uh, what I've done here is I'm going to take a straight polypropylene tenno uh, suture needle and come from one side, and I'm going to dock that needle into a, a 27 gauge needle coming across again two millimeters posterior to the limbus from the other side. And I'm going to dock that suture into that needle uh, and bring it out. And about two or three millimeters apart, I will take the second arm of the double arm tenoproline suture and uh, again, take a 27 gauge needle and then dock the 27 gauge needle and tenoproline suture needle together and then bring the two needle complex out of the eye. And so now I have a horizontal mattress suture underneath the lens in the horizontal meridian. Now, here I bend the needle and I'm demonstrating that so that when I dock it, now we're doing it in the vertical meridian, when I dock that um, tenoproline suture into the 27 gauge needle, I want to have firm uh, friction so that the uh, needle will not slip out of the, of the 27 gauge hypodermic needle. So we bend it and pass it across. And then you can see this gives us now a lens that is sitting on a safety suture net and we can do whatever we choose. We can remove it, we can suture fixate it depending upon our preference. Uh, here we'll demonstrate another case. This is a patient who uh, sustained a complicated cataract surgery. I refer to this as trifacia because she actually has two intraocular lenses, an anterior chamber lens and a posterior chamber lens placed at the same time about three weeks ago, and we'll also see subsequently she has some nucleus in the back of the eye, so she has three lenses. I refer to this as trifacia. So here, again, this is the uh, Tenno STC-6 uh, Tenno polypropylene that we're going to dock into a 27 gauge needle, 180 degrees apart, and um, I was doing this surgery in combination with a vitreoretinal surgeon who requested that I do this, but I don't ordinarily do it 
in a non vitrectomized eye, there usually isn't need. If the lens is very loose and subluxated, I will do it. And usually I reserve the safety basket technique for the post vitrectomy eye. But in this situation, I place it only in one meridian, not in two meridia. And now I'm going to use triamcinolone to stain the vitreous that's in the anterior segment and remove the vitreous from around the intraocular lenses so that we can safely remove both of them uh, before I turn the patient over to the vitreoretinal surgeon to do a parse plane of vitrectomy and remove uh, lens material from the posterior segment. So I have made a superiorly uh, oriented frown shape incision. I'm placing a sheet slide and sliding out the anterior chamber lens. Um, and now I'm going to remove some more vitreous from around the posterior chamber lens. And this is a single piece acrylic lens. Um, I really can't tell you what the surgeon was thinking when he implanted both of these, but uh, obviously the capsule was ruptured when he was placing the posterior chamber lens and he thought it was going to fall into the posterior segment, so he placed an anterior chamber lens at the same time. Uh, so now the posterior, the single piece acrylic posterior chamber lens is being freed from its attachment uh, in the back of the eye. And it will then uh, also, once the uh, vitreous adhesions are managed, the lens will then also be brought out through uh, the superior incision. Here we're placing some hydroxypropyl methyl cellulase on the cornea for protection and better visibility. Um, once both lenses have been removed, uh, a senecholysis uh, is performed and the patient is then turned over to the vitreoretinal surgeon um, in order to uh, do a part plane of vitrectomy and remove the lens material. Now I'm going to fixate to the sclera um, with Gore-Tex suture a Bausch & Loam hydrophilic AO60 lens. And the reason we can do this is the loops on that lens will allow us to have a continuous loop of Gore-Tex or tenoproline suture. So here the, we're going to use what we call needleless recovery. The needles have been removed from the Gore-Tex suture and it is looped through the positioning holes in the intraocular lens. Um, we reach through sclerotomies that are four millimeters or five millimeters apart and two and a half millimeters posterior to the limbus using two microsurgical instruments in a hand to hand manner. And the continuous loop of the Gore-Tex suture is then uh, both sides brought out, the lens brought in through the incision. And then again, making slip knots with gradual tensioning, the lens is centered uh, in the posterior chamber. Now, this material is hydrophilic, and there have been reports of this lens turning opaque when subsequent gas is put in the eye should be necessary, uh, either for a, a corneal lamellar surgery, such as a defake or demex, or if uh, the patient needs gas for vitreoretinal retinal surgery. There is an iatrogenic uh, hole in the iris and trying to remove some of the lens material by the uh, vitrector. And so that, that um, is being closed with a Caesar 10-O uh, uh, proline suture. And as I said, 10-O proline is fine for closing iris defects, but not for sewing to the sclera. And once that um, is tied and the pupil left round, then the surgery is completed. And now she has only one lens. And the micro scissor is used to cut the uh, tenoproline suture. And here we are checking to make certain that the incision is watertight using intraocular Seidel test. And again, using fibrin adhesive to close the conjunctival incisions. Now, Many people around the world are using a form of intrascleral fixation where the uh, loop of a three-piece lens uh, is brought out 
through a flap and then through a Shariot tunnel, the loop is passed into a scleral tunnel and then the flap is closed with glue. The glue technique has been popularized by Amar Agarwal, but we've seen some issues with this technique in our office. And here you can see a loop that's almost poking its way through the conjunctiva. So a more recent technique is the Yamani flange method uh, developed in Japan by Dr. Yamani. And here again, we're marking the I-180 degrees apart. And in this technique, we're going to fixate an intraocular lens to the eye wall, a three-piece lens, and we're going to heat the haptics to make a little flange, and then that flange is going to be uh, placed in the scleral tissue itself and holding it uh, by friction. So we mark two millimeters posterior and then two millimeters inferior to the left side and two millimeters superior to the right side. Uh, I'm placing trocars now to do both the trectomy and infuse the eye. Um, it is necessary to remove enough vitreous so that when you place the lens, you're not tugging on the vitreous base. Um, here, uh, the patient's pupil is somewhat updrawn from uh, congenital cataract surgery. This is a 21-year-old. We can see there's an inferior capsule through which we could support the lens, but we notice that there's no superior capsule. So we want to fixate the lens symmetrically, so we will fixate it to the sclera. This is diluted triamcinolone uh, that we're using uh, in order to do uh, a, a vitrectomy and enable us to see uh, where the vitreous is, it stains the vitreous. I'm testing now the paracentesis to make sure it's at an angle with which I'm comfortable in preparation for grasping the loops of the lens. And here I'm testing that these um, loops on this three-piece lens will fit into special 30-gauge needles. So once I know that, I know that I can fixate this lens through those needles. So the lens is inserted, leaving one loop externally. And then um, passing this uh, 20 degrees uh, angle and five degrees posteriorly, um, it's going to have about a two millimeter intraspleral path. We see the needle. I reach in and I take uh, a micro forceps and then tuck that suture into the 30 gauge needle and feed a good bit of it in. I then remove the syringe from the needle and just ignore the needle and then move to the fellow uh, haptic. So now we have the distal haptic in the loop. And so here I'm going back to, I'm going to have a 20 degree angle toward the limbus and five degree angle posteriorly, and then enter in through the pars plana, through the pupil. And now I'm going to bring the trailing haptic now into the uh, special wide bore 30 gauge needle. And here we feed it in, and we've done it at an angle that works well. That's why we check the paracentesis. And then we bring these ends out of the eye. Whichever end comes out first should be held, grasped, uh, and then cauterized. So here one comes out, we're going to hold on to it, and leave the other one alone for the moment. Then we can pull the other one out. We've got both of them free. And now we cauterize the end, make a little ball. And the lens of choice today is really um, the Zeiss lens that has um, uh, PDDF or Pinar haptic, they tend to make a, a, a more uh, or a larger um, mushroom to fit into the sclera, more robust. Um, now I'm just testing to make sure that that lens is nice and stable by pushing on it. And then I will uh, try and remove that iris from that old superior incision from the congenital cataract. Surgeon, we can see the previous iridectomy is now in full view. And we're going to remove the OVD and 
uh, from the chamber and then suture the incision if necessary. And so that's the Imani flange technique, which we use either for aphakia um, or a replacement lens. Setting pressure at physiologic levels. And then I like to do intraoperative Seidel testing on all incisions to make certain that they are watertight. Let's talk about exchanging lenses. We've dealt mostly with malposition, loose lenses. Um, uh, indications for lens exchange uh, would be late malposition lens that wasn't satisfactory in the first place, was in the wrong place. But we also have to deal with lenses that opacify, wrong power lenses, multifocal lenses where the patient failed to successfully neuroadapt, the dysphotopsias, UGG syndromes, and eyes that have tenderness to touch, typically from anterior chamber lenses. One of the skills that is necessary in order to remove and replace an intraocular lens, the ability to open the capsule bag. Let's look at this patient. Five years before this picture was taken, the patient had routine cataract surgery. But at the time of surgery, a pilot error occurred and the temporal loop of this lens did not get in the capsule bag. As a result, the inferior part of the lens sits anterior to the capsule bag, while the superior part of the lens is in the confines of the capsule bag, as is the loop on the nasal side. Now, this is a very low power uh, acrylic lens because it's low power, it is of meniscus design, and as a result, have a thick edge. And this thick edge here is sitting right directly against the iris, and you can see all of this iris transillumination. And if you look carefully, you can see some blood here. This patient has had a chronic UGH syndrome with multiple episodes of bleeding from iris chafing as a result of this exposed edge of this lens. Now, when we want to fix this problem, if we can reopen the capsule bag and tuck the loops and the lens back in the bag, we should be in fine stead. If we can't do that, we have to consider uh, taking the lens out and putting a lens that's kinder to the posterior iris than this uh, acrylic lens with a thick uh, abrasive edge. So here we are at surgery. And notice you'll see some blood moving around. It's some fine bleeding inside the eye. We're placing a dispersive visco agent. And the first thing I'm going to do is place an agent under the eye. And notice this is not in the bag inferiorly, but it is in the bag superiorly. So we're using OVG to help dissect the bag open. And then we're going to take a Sinsky hook and just spin the one loop that's in the bag outside of the bag so the lens will now be in the selfie. And now working under the lens, we're going to try and open up the capsule bag for 360 degrees so we can place this lens back in the bag. Now, let me freeze this for a moment. Where a capsule is in, in contact with the IOL, you tend not to get firm adhesion. But where a capsule is in contact with capsule, particularly capsule edge, that's where you can get a very, very firm fibrotic attachment. And the risks are that you could tear the anterior capsule, tear the posterior capsule, or tear the zonule. But if you work carefully, slowly, diligently with a good plan, you can have success. So let's follow this through. So I'm trying now to open where the bag is fused together where the lens is not in the bag. And I'm using OVD to try and make a tunnel and then using a blunt spatula um, on one side, that's on the nasal side. And now I'm gonna work on the temporal side, first some OVD to try and get into that space. And you'll notice that when I try to uh, manipulate that you're seeing the zonular fibers being stretched. So instead of stressing the zonular fibers, if we hold back the edge of the bag, which I'm doing here with a Sinsky hook, we can then use the, uh, the spatula to lice the adhesions rather than lice the zonular fibers. So here you can use any type of capsule support hook. In this case, I'm using a Sinsky hook 
to hold back the capsule bag and not stress the tightening the fibers. And even though it's been five years since the surgery was done, one can still open the capsule bag using the appropriate blunt dissection, visco dissection, and also uh, respecting the zonular fibers. And so now I am able to tuck the loops, both loops of the lens back in the bag and in this fashion avoid any further damage to the inferior um, iris. And in fact, this patient never had another episode of bleeding. We see the lens is now inside the capsule bag and we're rotating it uh, just so that it's stable and centered. And the OVG is then removed. Um, single piece acrylic lenses, let me read this a moment. Single piece acrylic lenses are a little bit different to remove. You'll notice in the previous one, I rotated the lens in the plane of the capsule bag in a clockwise fashion because that's the way the loop is designed. If the loops were facing to the uh, right instead of to the left, then we would rotate counterclockwise, but lenses are not designed that way. But single piece lenses, it's a little more tricky to get them out of the capsule bag because the end bulb and the Alcon lenses tends to get a little fibrous capsule. And on the AMO lenses, there's a little elbow up here, which also will create a, a, um, a tension point trying to get them out. So I use this as a um, femtosecond laser spatula that we're going to use to separate the anterior capsule uh, from the anterior surface of the lens. And then we're going to place some dispersive uh, OVD. And these lenses, I tend to lift more toward the cornea to break adhesions rather than rotate them circumferentially. Here, the lens is being elevated and some OVDs being placed along the channel, the fibrotic channel. I'm using a microsurgical instrument to hold the loop and then using a spatula to bluntly dissect down that channel that I've expanded with viscoelastic and then it comes out. And the same thing here. Um, a little traction and blunt dissection will get the loop out of the channel and then we can cut it, fold it, whatever our preference is to remove it. When we have a fibrotic um, anterior capsule late after surgery and want to remove the lens, then we have to deal with this anterior capsule. If you have a femtosecond laser available, uh, there is a very, very nice technique here to use a femtosecond laser to create a new anterior capsulotomy. Uh, my partner and I will soon publish a paper on this technique. And as we'll see here intraoperatively, uh, once the femtosecond laser procedure has been completed, Um, well, we can then uh, remove that capsule um, with a micro instrument and then remove the lens from the capsule bag as we saw uh, previously. So here's that secondary anterior capsulotomy. Um, unfortunately, you can't use a YAG laser to do this because that causes relaxing incisions. And the problem with that is that they will tend to relax out to the periphery. Now, if we take a look at this patient here, six months postoperatively, we can see this is that secondary anterior capsulotomy in the multifocal lens has been replaced with a single piece of acrylic. Sometimes it's better to cut the loop. Now, this is uh, a technus multifocal lens. And if you look carefully here, you'll note that there's a notch in this elbow, so to speak. And that made it extremely difficult to try to remove this uh, from the capsule bag. And you have to pay strict attention to the zonular fibers to be certain that you don't like them. 
So here I'm trying to get this up out of the bag and notice that I'm not having success. So what I instead do is um, I will cut this loop, remove the optic, and then it makes it much easier to remove the loop from the capsule bag. So here again, despite all my attempts, I can't get that elbow to come out of that fibrotic channel that is formed after surgery, and despite my best efforts uh, here using blunt dissection. So now I'm going to expand the tunnel. I'm going to cut the loop. And then once I have removed the optic from the eye and I have more room to work, I can reach into that capsule bag uh, with a serrated microforceps. And then it's just so much easier than to remove the loop. So sometimes it's better to cut the lens and remove it in pieces. Uh, here's a case of a three-piece lens. Now, somebody written in a question about glistening. This is a form of glistening, not that you see throughout the bulk of the optic, but this is immediately below the surface. It's the same condition of trapped water vapor in the lens. And this is called SSNG or subsurface nano glistening. And the interesting thing is in, in some directions of the light, the, light, the lens will look grayish white as here, uh, but sometimes at different angles of the light will actually look clear. Um, not many patients are symptomatic at this woman, but this is a three-piece lens. Um, and I encountered the same problem when trying to remove this three-piece lens um, as the loops were stuck and we had to cut them. Um, but let me just fast forward through this because I do want to show you uh, an important uh, aspect here. If you're going to cut the loops of a three-piece lens, try to do it as flush to the optic as you can. Um, so that, see here I'm trying to peel it out, won't come out of the bag. If you leave long loops with sharp edges, they can damage the iris or damage the cornea. But if you just cut as flush to the optic as you can, um, then you're not going to run that risk. So here, right on the optic uh, loop junction. And then this can be either folded uh, or uh, it can be um, cut depending upon what uh, you wish to do and what you wish to put back inside the eye. I, I want to leave enough time to talk about iris eutrophication, so let's move forward. Now, we can sew the loops of the lens uh, to the iris, and I prefer to do it today only in cases where we have capsule support, otherwise it tends to be late decentration. But in the past, I've used it for secondary implantation. But again, it's very, very useful. It preserves conjunctiva, a closed chamber surgery. Again, you have to remove enough vitreous so that when you're managing the lens, you don't leak through the vitreous base. This is a patient who had a ruptured capsule, ruptured inferior zonule, and I captured the optic now with the optic uh, anterior to the pupil and the haptic uh, posterior in the posterior chamber. And I'm coming across the chamber with a 10 polyester suture. And we do the same thing on the opposite side. This is going to be the Seepser suture method um, where we reach through a paracentesis. Now, unfortunately, 10 suture is difficult to see, but hopefully you have enough of a view. We're gonna reach through and create a loop of suture and make um, a three throw loop here. So one, two, and three, and then grab the free end of the suture and go across to the other side. So the knot's been made outside. Now Amar Agarwal is now suggesting four loops and that's all you need. Most people make three one and one having to reach into the eye again. Um, I'm going to demonstrate two types of iris suturing here. Um, I tend to prefer deep suturing to close 
defect to the iris, the patient had a notch, unfortunately, in the iris from vitrectomy surgery. So we come across a paracentesis with a tenoproline or tenopolyester suture. We grab that needle and bring it out through a paracentesis. And now, just as you saw in the previous um, eye, we're going to reach in with a micro hook, or you can reach in with a micro forceps. You can bring out a loop of suture material and make your three throws, and then grab the free end and pull in this fashion. So that is the Seepser sliding knot technique, extraordinarily useful. Some people prefer it to sew loops as well as to sew iris to iris. I happen to prefer the mechanical technique. So this is a malpositioned anterior chamber lens that was stuck uh, in a, a peripheral iridotomy. So we want to make our iridotomy uh, mid-periphery when dealing with anterior chamber lenses. And in order to prevent this from rotating back uh, into that iridotomy, I'm going to use a mechanical suture to sew the loop even of an anterior chamber lens uh, to the iris. So here we come through a paracentesis uh, underneath the iris, underneath the loop, back out through the iris, and then come out through the cornea. So now we have both ends inside the eye. We make a common paracentesis and then bring both loops out through the common paracentesis and tie in a three one in one fashion. And that is the mechanical technique of sewing loops of the lens to the iris. Um, and you generate the knot, the iris comes up to the knot. And there are modifications where we can actually slip this into the eye. Um, uh, Ike Ahmed has developed a technique and is referred to as the Mac Ahmed rather than the mechanical because he slides it into so I want to look at one last situation and then we'll answer questions. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Z syndrome, but I'm going to ask you this. A Z syndrome is associated with which intraocular lens? Three-piece acrylic lens, one-piece acrylic lens, artisan lens, crystal lens, or all of the above lenses. Z syndrome is associated with which intraocular lens? Three piece acrylic, one piece acrylic, artisan, crystal lens, or all of the above. And um, I, I gather from your answers that many of you are not familiar with the crystal lens. Um, and the crystal lens is the only lens associated with the uh, Z syndrome. It is a flexible plate haptic lens designed to accommodate, uh, but those plates of the lens may uh, unfortunately flex asymmetrically and the lens uh, be double angled kind of in a if you look in a cross section, looks like the letter Z. So here we can see such a case. Um, one is angled anteriorly, one angled posteriorly. And sometimes uh, surgeons use the uh, YAG laser to do extensive capsulotomy to take the tension off of these flexible haptics. And uh, the problem uh, with that is you often allow vitreous to come around and it often fails and then you have to do um, a surgery here uh, with vitreous in the chamber. And so again, we're going to see a triamcinolone uh, assisted vitrectomy because the lens is blocking any opportunity to reach into the pars plana. We're going to do an anterior vitrectomy. And these uh, lenses have very firm adhesions to capsules because they have a polyimide mustache shape haptic at the end of these plate haptics. Now silicone doesn't fixate to capsule as well as acrylic or the uh, polyimide materials, 
So we have to cut these, and you can see that little bit of that polyimide material um, still inside the capsule bag. So this lens is cut. Um, the haptics remain in the bag. The lens is then bisected and brought out through a three millimeter incision. And this can be replaced by a three piece lens. Uh, my preference is to put a three piece silicone lens uh, in the uh, posterior chamber and suture fixate the loops to the eye wall. So this is the LI-61 lens going into the uh, ciliary sulcus above the capsule bag. Uh, and then the loops will be fixated by sutures to the iris. Now, one of the problems with iris suture fixation is ovalization of the pupil. And I'll show you a little trick before we move on to answering your question. So here again, you're going to see this is the mechanical suture technique through a paracentesis under the iris, under the loop of the lens brought out through a common paracentesis. The uh, suture is then tied in a three one in one fashion. And then the optic is prolapsed into the posterior chamber. But notice that we have a cat's eye. So we're gonna try and take some of this iris that got captured by the suture and use a micro forceps to kind of tease those fibers out of that suture pathway. And that doesn't loosen the, the lens suture, just gets some of the iris material out. And then the uh, OVD can be removed with the vitrector. I prefer the vitrector just in case any vitrector has remained and moved forward. So I'd like to uh, finish with, uh, I saw there was one question and let's see if we can open up that question. Can we bring up that question? Or that, that box that enables me to see that. There it is. Okay, so I notice here, um, which are your criterion for using one type of suture or the other? And I think that's an excellent question. Um, if I'm going to fixate to the sclera, my preference is really the use of Gore-Tex suture. While nino uh, polypropylene is also very strong, um, its ends tend to erode through scleral pockets. Um, and I think it, long term, there are more concerns about it. Uh, I, I think that Gore-Tex is much easier to work with. And so long as you bury the knots, I think it's very, very safe. So for suing to the sclera, I'm going to prefer Gore-Tex. Um, for the iris, I only like 10O. If you're going to work with 9O to the iris, it tends to be a little bit brittle, and that would be 9 proline tends to be a little bit brittle and causes too much cheese wiring. So my preference uh, is to use uh, 10 proline on the iris and 8 Gore-Tex on the sclera. Um, I am happy to take any questions if anyone uh, has any questions for me. Uh, and we have reached uh, eight o'clock here on the West Coast uh, in Los Angeles. And I think that uh, completes our even, I think there were, I think there are, are there more questions I haven't answered? Yes, we can use Gore-Tex uh, in children and yes, we can use Pop and pocket, yes. So I think we answered all those questions. Uh, are there further questions? Um, if not, uh, I hope this has been of uh, uh, interest and benefit to you in your daily practices. Uh, the nature of our practice is we do manage many patients uh, with uh, malposition, malfunctioning IOLs. And should any of you want to visit us in Los Angeles, please feel free to do so.